Psalm 86, beginning at verse 9 through verse 17. Let us pay heed to God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forevermore, for great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, the proud have risen up against me, and a mob of violent men have sought my life and have not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in mercy and truth. O turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. That is verse 17, God's word from him, pardon me, Psalm 86. And now also to Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 22 verse 24. Again, this is God's word. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his, glory, of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. We end there, verse 24, God's word, if you've heard and received it then as his very word, I call upon you to confess it with me now by saying, amen. amen. Let us pray that the Lord might help us and illuminate our understanding. Let us pray. Come, our Heavenly Father, and by your Holy Spirit, we pray you would help us, that you would overrule our normal and native disposition to twist your word or to ignore it. We ask that you would teach us, and not so that uh, we might have our minds filled with interesting facts about your word, but rather that our hearts would be touched, would be changed, that our thinking would be changed, our behavior would be changed. We ask, our Father, that you would hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I suspect uh, you are you have a similar experience as I do in that uh, you go to the mailbox uh, on most days and you open up the, the mailbox and what you find is a bill or two and you might find some other thing or other. Um, but there are some, from time to time, there are invitations. And I don't know if it's because of the age that uh, my wife and I are now, but we get these invitations for a free dinner all the time. And it's a free dinner, no obligation, you understand. And they want to talk to us about our financial circumstances and what we're going to do in retirement. But it's a free spaghetti dinner, no obligation, of course. And we're given that opportunity, you see. We're invited to take advantage of that opportunity. Now, you may be wondering what in the world free spaghetti dinners have to do with <laughs> the text that's before us. Well, it has to do with, I think, how we ought to approach this text. We are being invited here, not to a free spaghetti dinner, but we're being invited to answer the hypothetical. Now, it's very artfully rendered here by the inspired apostle, but he's inviting us to do something. And the nature of hypothetical questions is that there's an obvious answer, and that's the power of the hypothetical, the rhetorical, we might say, question more particularly. So the rhetorical question then assumes a particular answer, and this is a particularly hypothetical, supposedly, set of questions. Now what you may gather here, perhaps it's somewhere on the edges of your mind here, that it's kind of an unusual little portion of Scripture 
It's, un, it's grammatically unusual, I'll tell you. It's, un, it's grammatically unusual in the English. It's grammatically unusual in the original. And so the, the English here rendering shows it, generally, that there's really no subject grammatically. There is a subject contextually. So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to bring forward the accusation that we saw earlier in the previous verses, and that accusation is that there's divine injustice in matters of election, in the matters of predestination, in the matter of God's free choice to choose some and to pass by others. That's the assumed subject. That's the context of these questions that seem to appear out of nowhere in Paul's instruction to the church. And you may see here that the, the outline I've provided to, to you follows more or less this, this pattern. There are really two points in general that the apostle is making here. What if God showed his wrath and what if God showed his mercy? One of the things that we know is, in fact, God does show his wrath and God does show his mercy. So what's the apostle's point here? And that's what I hope to drive home this morning. And so what we're going to look at here first in, in verse 22, when he asks that question, what if God, wanting to show his wrath, etc., what is the manner of God's wrath and power being shown? What is he wanting us to consider here for a moment? Now, if you look closely, especially here as I'm, I'm reading out of the, the uh, New King James, that little word, what if God wanting to show his wrath, that reflects something also that's going on grammatically here in that little participle wanting. And that is an expression of God's will. So wanting, probably that rendering, you know, here is maybe not strong enough. That is, what is God's desire, we might more particularly say. So what if God is desiring something? There's a way that maybe we might say it in more maybe clumsy English. What if God is desiring a particular thing? What if he's desiring, <clears throat> if he's desiring that his, in this particular case, that his wrath be shown? What, what if? What if? Well, not only do we have the more immediate context, we have the context of the whole book of Romans and, in a sense, the whole of the scriptures here. What do we read in the very first chapter. It seems like we always end up back in the first chapter of Romans, don't we? That God's wrath is shown, right? We know that this is true. He's already revealed this to us. We know it even by general revelation. Well, see, the fact of the matter is that it is God's desire that his wrath be shown. That's the point. He is wanting this. But not only his wrath, but as it is here, his power, both. Here, this, this power to judge, this power to punish, he wants that to be shown. Now, we know if we, if we trust in the Lord, if we believe the, the biblical testimony of who God is and who Jesus Christ is and the nature of our relationship to our creator, all those things, we know that God's will and power are shown, and shown in many ways. That's not a particular question either. That's not something that, that we might debate. In fact, in a sense, that's really not, when it comes down to it, the apostle's really main point here. He's wanting us to consider something. He wants us to consider this rhetorical, sort of hypothetical sort of question. See, God's will and power are shown in many ways, but it is in this particular way, in this particular revelation of his wrath and power. To what end? To what purpose? What does the text say? To make his power known. You see, that little participle at the beginning of this verse is really, really important because it's talking about God's continuing action to do something over this course of time. He's wanting to show his, his wrath and his power. It is his will, it is a desire that this happen. Well, how does that happen then? So if this is 
God's express will, his express desire. This is, this is what he wants to do. And if he wants to do it, then he will do it. Then how does that happen? And that leads us to the question of the mystery of God's will. Now here it doesn't seem so mysterious, right? It's pretty explicit here, isn't it? And yet there is a mystery because we have to continue reading, right? Because it says he, he desires to make something known, his wrath and his power, and that's his continuing desire, his continuing expression of his will. And how is that expressed? It is expressed with, endured with much long suffering. Now that's not the way that we normally speak, particularly in the sense of endurance of God. Yes, he's long-suffering, yes. But remember what it is we're talking about. We're talking about his will to show his wrath, to make his wrath known, his will to show his power, to, to make his power known, and it's revealed in divine endurance. Endurance with what? With people who hate him, with people who have turned from him, with people who are in darkness, with people who seek not only to get away from God, but even sometimes seek to harm what, how God is manifested in, in the world, and particularly, for example, the church as an institution or people, the people who are in it. And yet, God endures this. Now, I'm going to touch on this in a moment, but I just want to give you a little hint here of what, what Paul's point is, is that... Could God have shown his wrath earlier? Could his endurance have not been so enduring? Could God have possibly not been so long-suffering? Or as it says here, with much long-suffering. Of course, the answer to that is yes. That would be, I suppose, possible, we could say. But the ultimate mystery here, the ultimate thing that's revealed to us is in this endurance and this long-suffering is what I am calling here, I guess for lack of a better term, divine freedom. See, that divine endurance, that divine much long-suffering is also met with divine freedom. You see, one of the things that we find in this the revelation of, of God's plan of salvation from the very beginning until now and even unto the end and into eternity is one that God is not bound to anything but his own character, his own nature of who he is. That is to say, he can choose to endure and to suffer long those who despise him and hate him. And in fact, he's not bound in any way outside of himself to crush unbelievers right now. He might wait. In fact, we know that he has waited. See, these, this long-suffering, this endurance and much long-suffering is towards, as it says here, the vessels prepared, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. You see, it's not that destruction will not come. It will come. That's not the question that's before us, but the vessels that have been prepared. And I'm going to continue to hammer home some grammar here. For you, for you grammar geeks, you may enjoy this. For those who don't, you will have to endure with much long suffering my grammatical stuff here. It's a perfect passive participle. That is, having been prepared That is, there's, there's an allusion back to the potter that's in the immediate context. See, you remember from very recently here, I hope you remember, there's this illustration of the potter. And can, can the, the clay say to the potter, why are you making me this way? That the, the clay can assert its authority over the potter and say, no, you must make me this way. And that absurd and, in a sense, almost comical illustration here in this intensely serious question. Here, and particularly grammatically, what he's saying here is that, th that these have already been prepared, and that preparation is complete. That's the significance, grammatically, of what's going on here. So if we want to talk about election, we want to talk about reprobation, 
which is usually the ha half of the equation that we don't like talking about so much. Here, specifically in the word used, in the tense in which it is used, is speaking of that completed action that has been done on its object. That tells us something about the nature of God's eternal decree. Now, wait for it. There's something extraordinary that's about to happen here. So just remember here that what we're speaking of is God's purpose. God's purpose isn't determined as time goes along, right? His endurance, his much long suffering, it's not a question of God saying, well, I just, I, I just don't feel like it today, maybe tomorrow. That's not what's going on. That's the way we behave in regard how, to how the Creator looks at these vessels. The vessels are done. They're, they're formed. They've been fired, glazed, however, whatever happens. I don't know all of that, how that works. It's done. No changes to be made. They are prepared, have been prepared, passively, for destruction. Now let's be very, very careful in the terms that we use and how we understand this. Destruction is not annihilation. Those two things are different. Now if you ever went to the uh, home and garden store and you bought a clay pot and you hung it on a little hook on your patio or something like that and you had some nice flowers growing up, out of it and so on and the windstorm came and blew that pot off of its hook and it landed on the patio <clears throat> what's the result well the pot is shattered right the pot is broken up into big piece, bigger pieces and tiny pieces and the soil is everywhere and it's a, a huge mess it didn't fall to the ground and vaporize and disappear did it see that's what is being spoken of here. That is destruction in the sense of ruin. See that pot that just fell off the hook that was on your patio and was so beautiful to the outward looking eye to you or so on, that fell and now is completely useless. It has been ruined. It can't be put back together again. See, it's a picture here I, I really, the apostle is carrying this, this forward for us, continues to remind us of this. This destruction is not annihilation. It is ruin, utter ruin. For those of you who like, by the way, the pilgrim's progress, just here as an aside, this is the word here that we get Apollyon from, in case you're wondering the name of the great adversary in the pilgrim's progress. We're, we're looking at verse 22. Let's ask the question. But let's ask the question in a different way. What if God brought his full wrath to bear at the beginning? When was his wrath earned? Well, his wrath was earned at the tree in the garden. There were two people, Adam and Eve. God had warned Adam, had warned Eve, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That's when it was earned. That's when they could have justly been consumed. And what if God had brought his full wrath then at the beginning? What would have been the end? What would have been the result? Adam and Eve would have been consumed in a moment and everything, everything, that God had decreed, as we understand it now, would have fallen into ruin. But no, he endured. He suffered long, as it were. And what if God exercised his power right there at the beginning? What if he would have done that? Well, we can speculate, right? We can say, well, okay, Adam and Eve would have been destroyed. Maybe God would have created a new Adam, maybe he would have done something else. Maybe he would have wiped out the cosmos and started over. We can speculate and do so, I think, without sin. Sort of, it's an interesting thought experiment, I suppose. But wait, wait for the third question. What if that was done without the promise of the gospel? What if he showed his wrath? What if he showed his power at the beginning and there was no promise of the gospel? What if, in fact, there was no mercy? What then? 
we'll see then the whole message of the gospel, the whole promise of the gospel, even as we understand by further revelation, the decree from the beginning, that is, before time, falls to the ground. And what if then the accusation might be leveled that Satan had in fact won, ruined everything that God had planned with the simple temptation to eat of the tree. But that is not what happened. That's not what happened because of what we see next. Yes, God's wrath, he desires it be shown. He desires to show his mercy, his power, his wrath and his mercy, and his wrath and his power, he desires to show that. And he endures long with those vessels who are headed into the ruin. But God also shows mercy. What if God showed his mercy? And likewise, let's, let's consider, consider the manner in which God's mercy is being shown here. See, the long-suffering disposition of God also means that he shows mercy to more and more. That is, if he had determined to wipe out the human race right there at the beginning with the two humans, then there would be no showing of mercy, no divine mercy. And the longer that he endures with much long suffering, those vessels that have been fashioned, that have been formed unto destruction, the longer that he endures, the more mercy he shows to his people. See, that's the part we get often, we stumble at the first, right? Because it's, it's about as heavy as it gets in the scriptures. And then, yet it is here. In verse 23, particularly. See, this is the return to the great theme of this passage of the entire chapter here. And that is, it is all sovereign grace. You see, the Lord chooses to endure. He chooses to suffer long, those vessels. But at the same time, he shows his mercy to other vessels. Unto what end? Unto what end? Well, previously we saw that it was so that his power and his wrath might be shown. It might be manifested. It might be demonstrated in ultimately the destruction of those vessels. What is the ultimate end here in this text, in this particular verse? The ultimate end, his glory. The ultimate end is his glory. Now, what does it mean, particularly, God's glory here? How, how should we understand this? Well, that's, that's a, actually a, a pretty deep question, if I might say so myself. How, how is God's glory shown? Well, that's a, that's a huge subject all on its own. But one of the things I can say, I can say that it, it is not. It is not according to your view of what glory is <laughs> by nature. See, we view glory in a particular way, don't we? Right? There's, uh, I understand, I've heard rumors that uh, the baseball season is ending. And there's going to be playoffs. And there's, I assume there's going to be a World Series at some point. Back when I, I used to watch those things. <laughs> <laughs> with some joy. And there's going to come a point where there's going to be some people with their arms raised and they're going to have a very shiny trophy, a very fancy trophy, and they're going to parade it around and there's going to be a parade in the city probably of, of the town that has won the World Series. And okay, that's all very well and good. It's Adi Afra. It's neither good nor bad. It's fine. But that glory is fleeting. That glory will pass. Who won the World Series in 2007? Do you happen to know? I know there's probably some who know. No, you can look it up. You can find out very quickly. You can look it up in, on, your, on your phone. Don't do it now. Keep your phone down. The glory fades, doesn't it? Statues are torn down, and the ones that aren't torn down are covered with pigeon droppings. It's a, it's a fading glory. It doesn't really ultimately matter in the grand scheme of things. You see, that's, that's the way we often think of glory. And yes, as Christians, we, we understand at least after a fashion what it means for God's glory to be demonstrated. Yes, we understand that. But to fully comprehend here 
the idea that God would suffer long, that, that he would delay the ultimate end for those vessels that are determined unto destruction so that he might be glorified in showing mercy to other vessels. That starts to get to the farther reaches of our ability to understand, see, because he has mercy, and a mercy that's according to his view and not ours. How do we show mercy? Well, we often do grudgingly. We often do so maybe with the hope of a quid pro quo, I'll be nice to you and you be nice to me kind of mercy. See, God is not a debtor to you. He's not a debtor to me. He's not a debtor to, to, to show you mercy. In fact, that goes to the heart of what his divine mercy is. And the fact that he does show mercy, and he does so to amplify his glory for that reason and for, if, for nothing else at all, you should be eternally grateful. See, just as there's a mystery of God's will, his desire regarding those vessels which are destined to destruction. There's also a mystery of God's will here. That's the same, it's the same idea, except the, the focus is different, isn't it? Consider the parallel. Is the Lord's wrath any more mysterious than his mercy? Think about that for a moment. Actually, it's the contrary. If anything is more mysterious, it's his mercy, not his wrath. And there's also something else, and this is, I hope, the, the payoff. I said, wait for it. There's something else coming. We have two vessels here. It would appear, perhaps, outwardly that they're the same, and it would appear that maybe they're, you know, they're equally fragile, I suppose. But here the language is different. In this case, it's significantly Different. Not only is it a different word, it's a completely different word for prepared. Previous word means completely prepared. This one doesn't have that nuance of meaning, and I think that's significant. But it's also in a different tense. And that different tense here, the implication is that more work is yet to be done. <laughs> Praise God. There's more work yet to be done. It's still there. It's still possible that more work might be done. You see, that's the mercy, right? That's, that's the, the grace expressed. The yes, that's, here's a vessel that is, that is fashioned and ultimately fashioned for glory, and it is going to be continued to be refined and fashioned, and he continues to work on those vessels. What a glorious truth this is. See, wrath and mercy here. Let's speak very plainly. Wrath and mercy here are not in opposition to one another. They're perfectly in harmony according to God's perfect attributes. They're, it's not, it's not, they're, they're not uh, in conflict in God, in his, in his being. And in fact, when we rightly understand it, we understand what the apostle is getting at here is one magnifies the other. See, what, what if you had filet mignon for dinner every night? You might think, yeah, that sounds pretty good. What about every night for the next month? Two months? Yeah, you might want to might want a, a chicken breast or something after a while. Well, see, this goes to the issue here. What if we didn't have even the slightest concept of God's wrath and his judgment and his power and his authority to do such a thing. If we had no concept of those things and all we saw was the merciful side, well, we would, I suppose it's a great blessing, right, to, to have the resources, to have a kind of a filet mignon dinner every night, I suppose. Someone else would have to tell me that. But to have a meal, a simple meal, and then occasionally have that feast, See, that makes that feast so much more sweet, so much more delicious, doesn't it? To, to have that special meal. Well, in that sort of odd sort of way, right, that, it, that the great thing is, it, it seems more greater. Can I say it that way? It's in relation to that simple beans and cornbread dinner that you have most nights. You see, both reflect one another, but mer the God's mercy is particularly reflected in his wrath. 
the glories of his mercy. See this, when it talks about his glory, here's how we ought to understand this. He delays his just wrath. He delays with much long suffering and endures with those who hate him so that he might show his mercy. And that mercy is even more glorious for the fact that he has not brought that ultimate justice and judgment on those who deserve it and who are destined for it. But rather he has shown mercy to those who deserve it. And that is the greater mystery. Unless we misunderstand here, the apostle, as he Again, goes back to some previous themes here. He says, essentially in verse 24, and by the way, this doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. This is a human condition. This is a human reality. See, the blessings of divine mercy are for all and for all times because that is the Lord's eternal purpose. And that eternal purpose is expressed throughout the scriptures. We read some of that in Psalm 86. It's what we confess when we're asked, what do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church and the Catechism in question and answer 54? You remember the very first line, how that's answered? That out of the whole human race, from the beginning of the end of the world, the Son of God by his spirit and word gathers, defends, and preserves for himself unto everlasting life a chosen communion, and so on. Out of the whole human race, it's universal, God's mercy Now, that doesn't mean that it's extended to everyone in the same way. There's a sense in God's long-suffering and his endurance that there's a mercy in that in one way, I suppose, but particularly the mercy of salvation as in Jesus Christ. That is for all, for all time. And that mercy... The mercy that is expressed in the course of him enduring with much long suffering is demonstrated in the incarnation, humiliation, sin-bearing, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Savior. It is represented and demonstrated to us in his promise coming again to take us unto himself, even according to what the ancient promise is, that he would be our God and we would be his people. You see, this is repeated over and over and over for us in the scriptures, and from, and it, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. And when Jesus was coming to this earth, he had taken upon himself human nature. In Matthew 1.21, what is it that is told to Joseph? He says, you shall call his name Jesus for what? I hope you could finish that for me. He shall save, he will save his people from their sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, in the incarnation, by its very nature, was part of his humiliation. By his sin-bearing, that's part of his humiliation for your sake. His death, dying for the sins that are not his own, but yours and mine. It's part of his humiliation. But that's not where it end, ends, does it? Because ultimately the promise is fulfilled. I love going back, by the way. Just Genesis, um, pardon me, uh, Revelation 20 through 22. I just, I just I, it seems like I'm always drawn to that. And here I am again in Revelation 21, beginning at verse 22. But I saw no temple in it. And this is speaking about the city Oh God, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or, or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. You see, that's the fulfillment of that promise that at all times and everywhere from every nation, every tribe, kindred, and tongue, he will call out his people in the course of his endurance and long-suffering of those who have been fashioned for destruction. And not only just as the forgiveness of our sins, but in the fulfillment of that ancient promise that he will be with us always. Think about this now, particularly in the context of what we are about to do when we come to the table. So what is the significance of the elements on the table? 
What is the significance of those elements? Well, we could certainly we could go back to the catechism and we could read a number of questions and answers that speak to that, but what I will ask you now, what is what is the significance? Well, at the at a very base understanding, a very foundational understanding, it is the broken body and the shed blood of Christ. Well, why? It was because of sins. It was because that wrath was poured out, poured out upon him. That which you deserved has been poured out upon him. And the fact that we take it and that we eat it shows us that we participate in that sense in both his death and his life. Because that humiliation also leads to the resurrection and the ascension and his session at the right hand of the Father. You see, the significance as we come to the table today speaks exactly to the text. We see both wrath and mercy in the elements on the table. We see both glory and humiliation in the elements on the table. And those are the things that we ought to perceive as well as our union together in Christ and with one another as we share together. And we're reminded as we come to the table that it has always been the plan. It has always been God's purpose. It's it's revealed to us in the covenant between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the creation of the cosmos. It's revealed to us in the covenant of grace where God had promised that there would come a Savior right there at the very beginning. Genesis 3, that the, son, that the seed of the woman would crush the seed of the serpent. And as you go through the whole history of redemption throughout the scriptures, you find that this covenant of grace is repeated over and over and over again and expanded more. We understand more and more as we go through the historic covenants to Noah, to Abraham, David, and so on, Moses and David, and so on. And then we come to the new covenant. And Christ says, a new covenant I make. That is, in this time, in in these last days, this ultimate showing of the covenant of grace. Looking forward to that time when we will enjoy the full blessings at the last day. And this has always been the plan. It's always been the plan that he would endure with much long suffering those vessels that have been fashioned unto destruction so that all of these things might be accomplished according to his will and purpose. Well, is God merciful? Yes. Our confession says so, as we're asked that in question and answer 11. God is indeed merciful, but he's likewise just. His justice, therefore, requires that sin which is committed against the most high majesty of God be also punished with extreme, that is, with everlasting punishment, both of body and soul. What if, what if, what if that mercy is extended to you and you receive it with faith and joy? Well, that means that that justice has been meted out on Christ and you are free. The Lord is indeed long-suffering, That's what the scriptures tell us here. The scriptures also tell us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We read that in 2 Peter 3.9. So the Lord is still working out his purposes. He's still enduring, and he's still showing his mercy, and he's still glorifying himself, and he will show his wrath and his power, and will continue to do so, and he will also show you mercy in Jesus Christ. Because now, right now is the accepted time. Right now is the day of salvation, as we also read in 2 Corinthians 6.2. So come come to Christ. Savor that mercy. Come to the table if you trust him and you're following him. And savor that mercy because it is yours in Christ. Because, in fact, he has shown his mercy. Amen.